The Elfin Knight. Hello, this is Geoffrey, and this is a spooky tale from Scotland. If you're not very good with spooky tales, then perhaps this isn't the one for you. Just in case you're not familiar with some of the Scottish words, let me explain that a bairn is a child. There is a lone moor in Scotland, which, in times past, was said to be haunted by an elfin knight. This knight was only seen at rare intervals, once in every seven years or so, but the fear of him lay on all the country round, for every now and then someone would set out to cross the moor and would never be heard of again. And although men might search every inch of the ground, no trace of him would be found, and with a thrill of horror the searching party would go home again, shaking their heads and whispering to one another that he had fallen into the hands of the dreaded knight. So, as a rule, the moor was deserted, for nobody dare pass that way, much less live there, and by and by it became the haunt of all sorts of wild animals, which made their lairs there, as they found that they were never disturbed by mortal huntsmen. Now in that same region lived two young earls, Earl St. Clair and Earl Gregory, who were such friends that they rode and hunted and fought together, if need be. And as they were both very fond of the chase, Earl Gregory suggested one day that they should go hunting on the haunted moor, in spite of the Elfin King. Sir, sir, I hardly believe in him at all, cried the young man with a laugh. Methinks tis but a tale to frighten the bairns, lest they go straying among the heather and lose themselves. And tis pity that such fine sport should be lost because we two bearded men pay heed to such gossip. But Earl St. Clair looked grave. "'Tis ill meddling with unchancy things,' he answered, "'and tis no bairn's tale that travellers have set out to cross that moor "'who have vanished bodily and never mere been heard of. "'But it is, as you say, a pity that so much good sport be lost, "'all because an elfin knight chooses to claim the land as his "'and make us mortals pay for the privilege of planting a foot upon it. "'I have heard tale, however.' that one is safe from any power that the knight may have if one wears the sign of the Blessed Trinity. So let us bind that on our arm and ride forth without fear. Sir Gregory burst out into a loud laugh at these words. Do you think that I am one of the bairns, he said, first to be frightened by an idle tale and then to think that a leaf of clover will protect me? (laughs) Ha! No, 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 carry that sign if you must. I will trust to my good bow and arrow. But Earl St. Clair did not heed his companion's words, for he remembered how his mother had told him, when he was a little lad at her knee, that whoso carried the sign of the Blessed Trinity need never fear any spell that might be thrown over him by warlock or witch, elf or demon. So he went out to the meadow and plucked a leaf of clover, which he bound on his arm with a silken scarf, Then he mounted his horse and rode with Earl Gregory to the desolate and lonely moorland. For some hours all went well, and in the heat of the chase the young men forgot their fears. Then suddenly both of them reined in their steeds and sat gazing in front of them with affrighted faces. For a horseman had crossed their track, and they both would fain have known who he was and whence he came. By my troth! "'But he rides in haste, whoever he may be,' said Earl Gregory at last. "'And though I always thought that no steed on earth could match mine for swiftness, "'I reckon that for every mile mine goes, his would go seven. "'Let's follow him, and see from what part of the world he comes from.' "'The Lord forbid that you should stir your horse's feet to follow him,' said Earl St. Clair devoutly. "'Why, man, tis the elfin knight!' Can't you not see that he does not ride on the solid ground, but flies through the air, and that he is really carried by mighty feathers, which cling to the air like those of a bird? Follow him! It will be an evil day for any man who does that. But all St. Clair forgot that he carried a talisman, which his companion lacked, that enabled him to see things as they really were, while the other's eyes were blind to the magic 
and he was startled and amazed when Earl Gregory said sharply, Your mind has gone mad over this elfin king. I tell you, he who passed was a goodly knight, clad in a green tunic and riding on a great black horse. And because I love a gallant horseman, I would fain learn his name and rank. I will follow him till I find him, even if it be at the world's end. And without another word, he put his spurs to his horse and galloped off in the direction which the mysterious stranger had taken, leaving Earl St. Clair alone upon the moorland, his fingers touching the sacred sign and his trembling lips muttering prayers for protection. For he knew that his friend had been bewitched, and he made up his mind, brave gentleman that he was, that he would follow him to the world's end if need be, and try to deliver him from the spell that had been cast over him. Meanwhile, Earl Gregory rode on and on, ever following the path of the knight in green, over moor and burn and moss, till he came to the most desolate region that he had ever been to in his life, where the wind blew cold, as if from snowfields, and where the hoar-frost lay thick and white on the withered grass at his feet. And there, in front of him, was a sight from which mortal man might well shrink back in awe and dread. For he saw an enormous ring marked out on the ground, inside of which the grass, instead of being withered and frozen, was lush and rank and green, where hundreds of shadowy elfin figures were dancing, clad in loose, transparent robes of dull blue, which seemed to curl and twist round their wearers like snaky wreaths of smoke. These weird goblins were shouting and singing as they danced, and waving their arms above their heads, and throwing themselves about on the ground, for all the world as if they had gone mad. And when they saw Earl Gregory halt on his horse just outside the ring, they beckoned to him with their skinny fingers. Come hither! Come hither! They shouted, Come, tread a measure with us, and afterwards we will drink to thee out of our monarch's loving cup. And, strange as it may seem, the spell that had been cast over the young Earl was so powerful that, in spite of his fear, he felt that he must obey the elfish summons, and he threw his bridle on his horse's neck, and he prepared to join them. But just then, an old and grizzled goblin stepped out from among his companions and approached him. Apparently he dare not leave the charmed circle, for he stopped at the edge of it. Then, stooping down and pretending to pick something up, he whispered in a hoarse whisper, I know not whom you are, nor from whence you come, Sir Knight, but if you lovest your life, do not come within this ring, nor join us at our feast, else whilst you for ever be undone. But Earl Gregory only laughed. I vowed that I would follow the green knight, he replied, and I will carry out my vow, even if the venture leadeth me close to the nethermost world. And with these words, he stepped over the edge of the circle, right in amongst the ghostly dancers. At his coming, they shouted louder than ever, and danced more madly, and sang more lustily. Then, all at once, a silence fell upon them, and they parted into two groups, leaving a path through their midst. They beckoned to the Earl to pass along it. He walked through their ranks till he came to the middle of the circle, and there, seated at a table of red marble, was the knight whom he had come so far to seek, clad in his grass-green robes, and before him, on the table, stood a wondrous goblet, fashioned from emerald, and set round the rim with blood-red rubies. And this cup was filled with heather ale, which foamed up over the brim, and when the knight saw Sir Gregory, he lifted it from the table and handed it to him with a stately bow, and Sir Gregory, being very thirsty, drank. And as he drank, he noticed that the ale in the goblet never grew less, but ever foamed up to the edge, 
and for the first time his heart felt dread, and he wished that he had never set out on this strange adventure. But alas, the time for regrets had passed, for already a strange numbness was stealing over his limbs, and a chill pallor was creeping over his face. And before he could utter a single cry for help, the goblet dropped from his nerveless fingers, and he fell down before the elfin king like a dead man. Then a great shout of triumph went up from all the company, for if there was one thing which filled their hearts with joy, it was to entice some unwary mortal into their ring and throw their uncanny spell over him, so that he needs must spend long years in their company. But soon, their shouts of triumph began to die away, and they muttered and whispered to each other with looks of something like fear on their faces, for their keen ears heard a sound which filled their hearts with dread. It was the sound of human footsteps, which were so free and untrammeled that they knew at once that the stranger, whoever he was, was as yet untouched by any charm. And if this were so, he might work them ill and rescue their captive from them. And what they dreaded was true, for it was the brave Earl St. Clair who approached, fearless and strong because of the holy sign he bore. And as soon as he saw the charmed ring and the elfin dancers, he was about to step over its magic border. And as soon as he saw the charmed ring and the elfin dancers, he was about to step over its magic border, when the little grizzled goblin who had whispered to Earl Gregory came and whispered to him also. Alas! Alas! he exclaimed, with a look of sorrow on his wrinkled face. Have you come, as your companion came, to be elfin king with years or your life? Oh, if you have wife or child, I beseech you by all that you hold sacred to turn back before it be too late. Who are you? And from whence have you come? Asked the Earl, looking kindly down at the little creature in front of him. I came from the country that you come from, wailed the goblin. For I was once a mortal man, like you. But I set out over the enchanted moor, and the elfin king appeared in the guise of a beauteous knight, and he looked so brave and noble and generous that I followed him hither and drank of his heather ale, and now I am doomed to bide here till seven long years be spent. As for thy friend, Sir Earl, he too has drunk of the accursed drink, and he now lies as dead at our lawful monarch's feet. He will wake up, tis true, but he will be in the same clothes as I wear, and enslaved as I am. Is there nothing that I can do to help or rescue him? cried Earl St. Clair eagerly, before he takes on him the elf in shape. I have no fear of the spell of his cruel captor, for I bear the sign of one who is stronger than he. Speak speedily, little man, for time presses. There is something that you might do, Sir Earl, whispered the goblin, but to try it would be a desperate attempt, for if you fail, then could not even the power of the blessed sign save you. And what is that? asked the Earl impatiently. You must remain motionless, answered the old man, in the cold and frost till dawn break and the hour cometh when they sing matins at the holy church. Then you must walk slowly nine times round the edge of the enchanted circle, and after that you must walk boldly across it to the red marble table where sits the elfin king on it. You will see an emerald goblet studded with rubies and filled with heather ale. You must take the goblet and carry it away. But whilst you are doing so, let no word cross thy lips, for this enchanted ground whereupon we dance may look solid to mortal eyes. But in reality, it is not so. Tis but a quaking bog. And under it is a great lake, wherein dwells a fearsome monster. And if you so much as utter a word while your foot rests upon it, you will fall through the bog and perish in the waters beneath. So saying, 
The grisly goblin stepped back among his companions, leaving Earl St. Clair standing alone on the outskirts of the charmed ring. There he waited, shivering with the cold through the long, dark hours, till the grey dawn began to break over the hilltops, and, with its coming, the elfin forms before him seemed to dwindle and fade away. And at the hour when the sound of the matin bell came softly pealing from across the moor, he began his solemn walk. Round and round the ring he paced, keeping steadily on his way, although loud murmurs of anger like distant thunder rose from the elfin shades, and even the very ground seemed to heave and quiver as if it would shake this bold intruder from its surface. But through the power of the blessed sign on his arm, Earl St. Clair went on, unhurt. When he had finished pacing round the ring, he stepped boldly onto the enchanted ground and walked across it. And what was his astonishment to find that all the ghostly elves and goblins whom he had seen were lying frozen into tiny blocks of ice so that he was not sore put to walk amongst them without treading upon them. And as he approached the marble table, the very hairs rose on his head at the sight of the elfin king sitting behind it, stiff and stark like his followers, while in front of him lay the form of Earl Gregory, who had shared the same fate. Nothing stirred, save two black ravens who sat, one on each side of the table, as if to guard the emerald goblet, flapping their wings and croaking hoarsely. When Earl St. Clair lifted the precious cup, they rose in the air and circled round his head, screaming with rage and threatening to dash it from his hands with their claws, while the frozen elves and even their mighty king himself stirred in their sleep and half sat up as if to lay hands on this presumptuous intruder. But the power of the holy sign restrained them, else had Earl St. Clair been foiled in his quest. As he retraced his steps, Awesome and terrible were the sounds that he heard around him. The ravens shrieked and the frozen goblins screamed and up from the hidden lake below came the sound of the deep breathing of the awful monster who was lurking there, eager for prey. But the brave Earl heeded none of these things, but kept steadily onwards, trusting in the might of the sign he bore and it carried him safely through all the dangers and just as the sound of the matin bell was dying away in the morning air, he stepped onto solid ground once more and flung the enchanted goblin from him. And lo, every one of the frozen hills vanished along with their king and his marble table and nothing was left on the rank green grass save Earl Gregory, who slowly woke up from his enchanted slumber and stretched himself and stood up, shaking in every limb. He gazed vaguely round him as if he scarce remember where he was. And when, after all St. Clair had run to him and had held him in his arms till his senses returned and the warm blood coursed through his veins, the two friends returned to the spot where Earl St. Clair had thrown down the wondrous goblet. They found nothing but a piece of rough grey windstone with a drop of dew hidden in a little crevice which was hollowed in its side. That was The Elfin Knight. I hope you didn't find it too spooky.